I would like to now discuss politics of the moon. A particular conflict that is undoubtedly connected to the story of the moon is the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Their resulting space race culminated in the Apollo moon landings of the late 1960s and the early 1970s. The highly simplified explanation of the Cold War is that it was a global conflict between certain Western countries, led by the United States, and Eastern countries, led by the Soviet Union. In the map above, the blue-purple colors are showing the North Atlantic treaty organization, NATO, of those Western countries, and the Warsaw Pact between those Eastern countries. NATO formed in 1949, followed by the Warsaw Pact in 1955. Of course, part of the reason for the tension was two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, trying to establish dominance after World War II. Their economic and political systems were different, and each wanted their system to become the norm in the rest of the world. Both sides were very suspicious and mistrusting of each other, which only escalated tensions. Thus, the the Cold War was a war in the sense of two sides battling. Up to about World War II, human history is filled with wars and battles using the latest technologies. We discussed last week how rockets developed into a weapon of war over thousands of years. At the end of World War II, however, technologies of war had become so destructive that entire cities and possibly entire countries could be destroyed in one shot. At the end of World War II, the United States had developed the atomic bomb, which was at the time the most destructive weapon in the world. It was used twice against Japan in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On the left is an image taken after the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Together these two atomic bombs killed between 129,000 and 226,000 people. I've listed the equivalent explosive power in TNT. The Hiroshima bomb was about 16,000 tons of TNT, while the Nagasaki bomb was about 21,000 tons of TNT. Those were atomic bombs. The superpowers would go on to build even more destructive weapons called hydrogen bombs or H-bombs. The largest of them was the Tsar Bomba, which was detonated in a remote part of northern Russia. That bomb was equivalent to 50 million tons of TNT. These weapons led to an arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Each wanted to have more nuclear weapons than the other. This led to a policy of mutually assured destruction or MAD, a fitting acronym since one nuclear attack by one of them would lead to each of them attacking each other with nuclear weapons. This is why this conflict is known as the Cold War. It would have been utterly insane for the two superpowers to use these weapons in a conventional war against each other. However, the term Cold War isn't very accurate since there were a number of proxy wars between the United States and the Soviet Union. We have already talked a bit about the Vietnam War and the invasion of Czechoslovakia. The Cold War also meant allying with nasty individuals such as Augusto Pinochet, who was responsible for the brutal deaths of thousands of Chileans. On the left is a picture of Pinochet shaking hands with the then Secretary of State of the United States, Henry Kissinger. The Soviet-Afghan War was another proxy war where the Soviet Union tried to establish a communist government in Afghanistan, while the United States backed insurgent groups. The Cold War started towards the end of World War II. Here is a map of Germany where different colors identify regions controlled by different allied countries. From the top left, going clockwise, was the area controlled by the United Kingdom, then the Soviet Union, followed by the United States and France. Notice that in the Soviet Union zone, there is a small area that is multicolored. This is Berlin, where the city itself was divided into regions. These divisions would eventually lead to the formation of two countries, West Germany and East Germany. At the end of World War II, in addition to dividing up Germany, the Allies were also very keen on getting a hold of German scientists, engineers, and technicians. They were particularly interested in those who had expertise in rocketry. Operation Paperclip was a program run by the United States military that brought 1,600 German experts to the United States. One of those experts, shown in the picture, was Werner von Braun. His brother had walked up to a United States soldier and said, My name is Magnus von Braun. My brother invented the V2. We want to surrender. Werner von Braun is pictured at the end of the war with a cast because of a broken arm. During their trip to surrender, the driver had fallen asleep and crashed. The Soviet Union also had a similar operation where they acquired 2,200 German specialists. In the United States, Werner von Braun would go on to be a central figure in the Apollo program to put humans on the moon. His Soviet counterpart was Sergei Korolev. Korolev was vital to the Soviet Union space program
program, but his name and contributions were only known after his death in 1966. The Soviet Union was secretive due to the fear that the United States may assassinate Korolev. Korolev was working with rockets in the Soviet Union when he was in prison for about six years due to the accusation that he was purposely slowing down progress. The Soviet Union was getting frustrated by the advances in rocketry made by Germany during World War II. Korolev was released in 1944 and helped the Soviet Union use captured German V-2 rockets to further develop their own rocket program. Korolev is responsible for the launch of the first satellite, the first animal, the first man, and the first woman to space. Space exploration became a reality on October 4, 1957 when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. Sputnik was about 60 centimeters or 2 feet across. Shown on the right is a replica. Sputnik transmitted radio signals. I've included a segment of Sputnik's beeps. I've also included a video clip from that time. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here, an artist's conception of how the feat was accomplished. A three-stage rocket. Number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile. Its weight estimated at 50 tons. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. One of the great scientific feats of the age. Hearing these beeps and watching Sputnik go by in the night sky worried people in the western countries. We have already considered how at the end of World War II, large parts of the world were divided between two camps backed by two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Sputnik didn't have any weapons on board, but the fear was if satellite technology was combined with nuclear weapons. With Sputnik's launch, the Soviet Union had demonstrated superior technological capabilities. For reactions to Sputnik, take a look at this video. The reaction was one of astonishment and concern, for it was now known that a potential enemy was at least temporarily ahead in developing means for space travel. President Eisenhower reassures the nation that Russia's success with the first satellite does not indicate a serious lag in American rocket research. The morning of November 8, 1957, at Huntsville, Alabama. A sudden meeting has been called by General John B. Medeiros, Commanding General of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. All at once, Americans were interested in the oncoming age of space. And with the curiosity came a mounting, swelling demand to get a satellite into the air on the double. About a month after the launch of Sputnik, the Soviet Union continued with Sputnik 2. Sputnik 2 carried the first animal to space on November 3, 1957. The dog Laika is shown on the right with a model of the Sputnik 2 spacecraft shown on the left. Unfortunately, Laika didn't make it back to Earth. She likely died from hyperthermia. Within days of Sputnik 2's launch, there was a meeting at the White House and a follow-up report called a Gaither Report. The United States wanted to understand the implications of the new satellite technology. Their assessment was that the the Soviet Union was capable of inflicting 50% casualties on the United States. If you'd like to read the history of this period from the American space policy perspective, you can check out In Sputnik's Shadow. About a month after Sputnik 2, the United States attempted to launch its first satellite using the Vanguard rocket. At this point in time, the United States had two different rocket programs. Vanguard was run by the US Navy, and there was another group run by the US Army. The US Navy group was favored within the United States government. This video shows the launch attempt on December 6, 1957. Another setback for the United States. A loss of thrust and fall back to Earth in split second. The United States government then decided to give the U.S. Army Group the chance to launch a satellite. This group consisted of Werner von Braun. We have already seen the Jupiter C rocket from the lecture on rockets. This was the rocket used by the U.S. Army Group. Take a look at the video describing Explorer 1, America's first satellite, which was launched on January 31, 1958. But meanwhile, far across the country at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a sprawling 80-acre research and development complex in Pasadena, California, Scientists and engineers were racing toward the same deadline. 90 days to put a satellite into orbit. The Army is requesting the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to provide the following programs. 
First, the additional high-speed propulsion systems required. Second, the orbiting missile or satellite. And third, the necessary instrumentation to record and transmit the scientific data assigned to this experiment. This assembly, which is the actual payload for the satellite, contains both transmitters and necessary circuits for the impact microphone, which will detect the collisions with meteorite particles, and a Geiger counter to measure cosmic ray intensity. At Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Army's Jupiter C rocket is ready for America's second attempt to launch a space satellite. The hour's long countdown approaches zero, a moment of enormous tension, for every missile launching is still an experiment. Any one of tens of thousands of things can go wrong with catastrophic results. But all that can be done to assure perfection has been done. The moment is at hand, the countdown reaches zero. Some three minutes later, Explorer is in orbit, broadcasting to the world its coded scientific data. This close-up of the United States edition of Sputnik was made at a press conference with leaders of the scientific teams. Dr. Werner von Braun, Dr. James Van Allen, and Dr. William Pickering. A three-way collaboration between private industry, academic science, and the military. As the United States was taking their first steps into space, President Eisenhower was deciding what agency in the government was to be in charge of the United States space program. Two choices were the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, and the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. ARPA, which is now known as the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, is an agency within the United States Department of Defense. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was largely involved with airplane work, but they they had some experience with rockets with the X-planes. Given Eisenhower's military background, one may think he preferred military control. However, this quote from the book In Sputnik's Shadow partly explains why he eventually decided on a civilian agency. Quote, he gave a lot of weight to the views of the scientists. At the same time, he knew that the scientists would be happier having it in a civilian organization than having it given to the military. He wanted in a way to placate the scientists. He wanted to draw them closer to his operation. Thus, Congress passed the National Aeronautics and Space Act on July 29, 1958. This absorbed the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics into the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. The Soviet Union still kept their lead in the space race as they launched lunar Lunar 1 on January 2, 1959. Lunar 1 became the first spacecraft to get near the moon. Their intention was to impact the moon. They got within about 6,000 kilometers or a little over 3,500 miles of the moon. That is approximately three times the radius of the moon. On September 12, 1959, the Soviet Union achieved the goal of impacting the moon with the Lunar 2 mission. Lunar 2 became the first spacecraft on the moon's surface. I've shown the location of the impact site with an orange circle. The impact site is located within Mare Imbrium, close to the future Apollo 15 landing site. The Soviet Union sent two spheres as shown with markings of CCCP, which is the Russian abbreviation for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR. These spheres consisted of small pentagonal sections, and the spheres were detonated to spread those small sections near the landing site. I'll conclude today with Lunar 3, which was launched on October 4, 1959, by the Soviet Union. It was the first spacecraft to photograph the far side of the moon, the side of the moon we cannot see from the Earth. Lunar 3 is part of the reason why many of the features on the far side of the moon have Russian names such as Stilkowski Crater, as we saw in a previous lecture, and Mare Moskoviens, which means Sea of Moscow. Next time we'll continue with subsequent events of the Cold War as they pertain to the moon.